when I was seven, we moved to Germany. And so I was there from um, 85 to 91. And I was there when the wall came down. Um, so I was there from second grade to ninth grade. So I really had a whole bunch of different experiences as a kid. It was really a great time too, as far as field trips, because I took cosmetology in high school and we went to Paris to a hair show, you know, on a field trip. Or we, my Girl Scout troop, we went to Holland for, you know, an outing. And so just to be able to see all of that was an awesome um, upbringing. I had a friend, his name was uh, Brian Carter. And he was 21, and he was supposed to go into the Army. And it was in, like, August, September of 1996. Um, two weeks before he was supposed to go, he was at a house party, just a group of friends. There was about 10 of them. They were just hanging out. And there was a home invasion. Not everyone died. I think two people survived, but my friend Brian was one of them. So for me, that was my turning point. I went to the recruiter, the Air Force recruiter, and I talked to them about it. Um, and that's what made me um, decide to go into the military, uh, one of them because I kind of wanted to continue on what Brian couldn't do. I got into the delayed enlistment program. Um, I didn't, I just want to get out. I just want to get out of town. I didn't care. I just want to go, go do something, go find a career that's going to travel, get out, give me something, purpose in life. Um, Both of my dads had uh, military prior service. So when I joined, they, I, they were proud, I think, you know, as far as just continuing that on and then, um, yeah, so they thought it was a great thing. So after basic, I go to my first base and I was stationed, lo and behold, I wanted to see the world and I got stationed at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. So three hours <laughs> and I come home. So I was Airman basic and then I worked in the medical records section. Um, and I lived in the dorms and uh, I worked in records for about maybe a year, year and a half, and what they do um, is they, in our career field, you rotate. So you would go to different duty sections, you do one or two years and then they rotate you. So then I moved up to the orderly room, which is kind of like the personnel office, and I worked there. Um, here's a picture of me on my last day before I PCS, so this was me. By then I had two stripes, wow. so I was a A1C at the time, and that was um, my last day at Maxwell Air Force Base in the orderly room, and then I had um, um, I PCSed to Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. February of 2000, I deployed for the first time, and I I went to Prince Sultan Air Base. Uh, we called it PSAB, and that was in Saudi Arabia. And I didn't go as a medical tech or a medical admin. I went on, so we called it, which now, you know, with the political correctness, it was called escort duty. So when I tell people I deployed to Saudi Arabia for escort duty, they are like, escort duty? What are they sending female, you know, whatever. No, it wasn't. It was because we had third country nationals there doing work. For the Saudis and then they needed the American um, armed forces to watch them do their jobs so that they weren't writing down secrets or planes or whatever. So I met my husband, his name um, is Phil Granis, Phil Granis, and he was stationed in Sacramento um, at the base there, uh, McClellan, and he was also there for escort duty. And we met in like February 28th, and the reason I know it, because that was his birthday, I didn't know it was his birthday at the time. Um, we met in February, our deployment was up in April, and we got married in May. So I knew him like 45 days or so, and we got married, 
they were shutting his base down, so they ended up offering him a position in New Mexico, but at Cannon, which was about three hours away from my base. And so we were in Cannon for five years. We had two kids then. Um, so I had my son, Aaron, was born in 2000. And one in November 2001, and then my son Ethan was born in December of 2002. Of course, 9-11 happened um, in 2001, and I was seven months pregnant with my first son. Uh, my husband had deployed two days earlier. So I worked in the control center for the as an additional duty. So, of course, here I am seven months pregnant. We're in there watching the towers fall. My husband's deployed somewhere, you know, I didn't even know if he had gotten there yet. Um, so that was a very stressful time. I was put on bed rest about my eight month mark and um, couldn't, you know, I could only go to the bathroom kind of deal. And so my husband was deployed, I'm on bed rest, I had um, preeclampsia and so they ended up doing a Red Cross notification and bringing him home um, and then my son was born three weeks early and Phil got there like a week before. So he was able to be there for the birth of our first son and that was awesome. I mean, the, the Air Force moved mountains to do that because um, they, they, I've always had such really good supportive um, leadership and supervisors. Yes. So I had Ethan a year later, they're 12 months apart, and then um, we moved from Clovis, um, Cannon Air Force Base, to, uh, uh, deploy, uh, to Lapland Air Force Base. So then I was stationed at Wolford Hall, which was a tr level one trauma center. And so yeah, I deployed um, in, the, in um, May of 2006 through November of 2006. And I went to um, Baghdad, Iraq, um, Sather Air, Air Base, they call it BIOP, so it was at the, like, it was a little tiny Air Force base surrounded by 30,000 Army troops. It was there on the airport. I was there when, if you remember the deck of cards, right, um, Saddam Hussein had been captured or, and he was in prison. He was actually in prison there. I've, I saw his, um, I never saw him, but his uh, Humvee where they would take him back and forth for different things past that a couple times but they had his people or the ones that are high up like over the Air Force or over this or over that they were at a separate compound and at one time they decided that they were going to go on a hunger strike um, and the army psychiatrist at the time who for the that was there for the army had had a heart attack and they had sent him back to the states we had a psychiatrist and she ended up having to go there every day and interview those detainees to determine if they were in the right mindset to refuse to eat okay. we saw you know, these terrorists, and they just did horrible things, and they killed all these people, and, you know, you just have this this disdain for them. But then, on the other hand, I'm sitting in a room, a small room, um, with it's just them, like the translator, an army soldier, the psychiatrist, and then me, um, and they're, she's asking them about, you know, your grandkids, your wife, your whatever, and they're... Some of them talked, some of them didn't. Some of them, you could tell they all spoke English. Some of them would talk to their translator, some of them would speak English. It was very, it was hard, it was, it was, it was an interesting thing to see the other side of someone who, you know, like when you hear about serial killers or things like that, and you, all you can see is what they did. But then on the other hand, they have families and then they had a life and they love people and people love them. So it was an interesting thing to be able to see a perspective on some people. I was over a lot of programs at a high level and I mentored and I looked out for my people because that's what I felt that was what my job was, 
to be an expert in my field. But by then, I had already grown them, right? They're already experts. So I didn't need to be doing the day-to-day -day things. I need to look out for them. But and Phil got assignment to go to Korea for a year um, unaccompanied. And so I was supposed to deploy the same month he was supposed to go to Korea. And I, you know, we were just doing, we didn't put in any waivers, we didn't talk, to, we were just doing what it was that our job was. We had our family care plan in, in place, the kids are going to go live with my parents in Virginia, and, you know, do what we had signed up to do. But I had a supervisor who was, um, a, he was a really good supervisor who knew his troops, and that's the difference between you know, a good supervisor and just a supervisor. He knew his troops and he knew that Phil was going to Korea and he knew, of course, that I was deploying. And he talked to the commander and he said, hey, this is what's going on. They have two small kids. She hasn't asked about it. He hasn't asked about it, but is there any way we can put in a <clears throat> way to code her, put in a waiver so that she doesn't have to go while he's gone? And the commander's like, oh yeah, and so they did. And so I really appreciated that, that they were looking out for me um, in the best interest of our family. And while and Phil so was in Korea, a special duty assignment came up and I applied for it and I ended up getting it and it was to the Surgeon General's office for um, AETC, but the Air um, Training Command. Um, and it was over at Randolph. So it was still within San Antonio, just on the other side. And it was a three-year, four-year controlled tour, but Phil was in Korea, and what that is, it's a non-vol, it was non-voluntary um, remote assignment. And the rule is, or supposedly the rule is, if you go to Korea um, on a remote, you get your choice of base when you come back. He picked Little Rock, and my supervisors, again, like I said, I just had really good ones that looked out for me. Um, they released me from my special duty assignment to let me join Phil um, in Little Rock. And so that was our last um, base was Little Rock. We moved PCS to Little Rock Air Force Base in February. It's actually on my birthday, February 20th of 2009. 2013, 2014, that's when President Obama was in office, and they were offering, they had a, they needed to draw the troop strength down. They needed to get rid of a lot of slots. So they opened it up to the volunteers, and then so they, the volunteers, I guess they, I thought they said it was like 30,000 they needed to get rid of, and I don't know, I keep saying 30,000, maybe that's just a number that's in my head, but, um, they didn't, round one, they didn't get any, as many as they needed. Then round two, they offered what's called Terra, which is like an early retirement, and you had to have served, for the Air Force rules, like 12, you could get out, I don't know if it was 10 years or 12 years, up to 19. And I knew, being medical admin, as far as the criteria for, um, concurrent receipt for disability when you're rated for the VA. And I knew that one, and it was, I had a supervisor, again, I had really good supervisors who mentored me. Um, Jason Cothran, it was this uh, supervisor's name, and he's retired Master Sergeant, and I worked for him in, um, in readiness. Learned a lot of great things from him, and one of the things, he always looked out for his troops, that was his core thing, and he said to me, he goes, you know that in order for that concurrent receipt, CRDP, to kick in, not only did you, do you have to retire from the Air Force, but you also have to serve 20 years. So if you take this Terra, you're not going to be able to have the concurrent receipt. And I had some medical issues that were starting to come up. And actually, looking back at it, 20, um, retrospectively, I had um, presumptives for when I served in um, the desert. So when you're saying the second round of Terra, I believe you said, yes. so you accepted it and you yes. retired? At 17 and a half years. So, and so I've been working 
as the District Veteran Service Officer for the Arkansas Department of Veteran Affairs for the, about five and a half years now. And so I train and assist county service officers with helping veterans file claims for benefits and disabilities, things like that. I've enjoyed this job. I'm also the um, Arkansas Women Veterans Coordinator for the state. So there's 19,000 women veterans in Arkansas. We all have different experiences and I, I just, I would love to just focus on that one, the women veterans and their service. So I feel my legacy for, for my, those who served after me was to just work as hard as you can and look out for the other people. It's how can I help somebody for all of us to succeed and that's kind of the legacy that I hope that I had left.